it's just recording part. And thank you, Amit Chaudhuri, for having this conference and having me think again about modernism. And you'll see my, this is slightly surprising paper. I have an epigraph from David Anton, which I always think is very funny, that goes like this. From the modernism you want, you get the postmodernism you deserve. And uh, we'll think about that later. From the modernism you want, you get the postmodernism you deserve. The profound revolution of the early 20th century, designated by the term modernism, a term that I think refers not only to a period, roughly 1900, 1930, most people think, but also a place, Europe. And I'm gonna argue that modernism is basically a European phenomenon, not even an American phenomenon. We'll come back to that as well as a particular ethos, remains 100 years after its inception incomplete and open to the future. Modernism, in other words, is not yet finished, its momentum having been deferred by two world wars and the Cold War. As the late great critic Guy Davenport put it, I don't know if you know Guy Davenport's work, but a really wonderful writer, also fiction writer, and to me, a very important critic who died a number of years ago. He says this, this is in Geography of Imagination. Our age is unlike any other in that its greatest works of art were constructed in one spirit and received in another. There was a renaissance around 1910 in which the nature of all the arts changed. By 1916, this springtime was blighted by the World War, the tragic effects of which cannot be overestimated nor can any understanding be achieved of 20th century art if the work under consideration is not kept against the background of the war which extinguished European culture. Accuracy in such matters being impossible, we can say nevertheless that the brilliant experimental period in 20th century art was stopped short in 1916. Stravinsky had composed the Rite of Spring by then, Picasso had become Picasso, pound, pound, Joyce, Joyce. Except for individual talents already in development before 1916, moving on to full maturity, the century was over in its 16th year. Because of this collapse, which may well yet prove to be a long interruption, the architectonic masters of our time have suffered critical neglect or abuse and if admired, are admired for anything but the structural innovations of their work. It's interesting to read this right now when we have another war going on in Ukraine and God knows what will happen. You know, anything terrible could happen. But it, it is interesting to think of that background. Okay. At the same time, from its early days, modernism has been criticized. And it's by no means just today that that's true, going by its mission statement. But it has was from the first criticized for being racist, sexist and elitist, as well as its retrograde politics and its purest aestheticism. Modernist genius theory, for that matter, has been mocked by critics on both the left and the right, as is the purported emphasis on autonomy and the primacy of poetic form or narrative structure. As established a critic as Frank Kermode declared in the sense of an ending, 1967, that the system building and use of explanatory myth characteristic of Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, and Wyndham Lewis led to, to, quote, totalitarian theories of form that were matched or reflected by a totalitarian politics. Indeed, Eliot's celebrated cult of tradition could be seen in this context as longing for, quote, the continuity of imperial deposits, a persistent nostalgia for closed, immobile, hierarchical societies. Now, Kermode himself was not writing as a Marxist critic at all, but Marxist theory quickly picked up the thread as critic after critic came to uncover what Robert Casillo called vis-a-vis -vis Pound, the genealogy of demons. Pound's fascism and overt anti-Semitism, as expressed in his Rome broadcasts during World War II, which led to the poet's decade-long incarceration at St. Elizabeth's Psychiatric Hospital in Washington, were excoriated as somehow inherently modernist. Similarly, Eliot made a number of unfortunate anti-Semitic remarks in its statements in his poetry, as when in Gerontion, I will remind you, we read, my house is a decayed house and the Jew squats on the windowsill, the owner, spawned in some estaminet of Antwerp, blistered in Brussels, patched and peeled in London. 
Bertrand Russell, known for his pacifism in World War I and strong liberal principles, wrote letters home from Harvard, where he was in residence for a month, referring to the black waiters at the faculty club in language that makes Eliot's lines in Gorontion look almost tame. I mean, really he said really nasty, pretty disgusting things. And even Gertrude Stein, who as a female, lesbian, and Jewish writer would seem exempt from the prejudices of her day, subtitled her famous short story, Melanctha, a Negro story, recycling many of the racist concepts of the day. And such liberal writers as E.M. Forster thought nothing of presenting in a room with a view, Italians as warm, erotic, but obviously hopelessly backward by British standards. You know, the nice little Italian people, they're so charming and they make nice wine, but you can't take them seriously. That was the whole tone. And that, that Virginia Woolf pretty much had that tone about the Italians too. Yet as the 20th century, as the 20th century recedes in time, a strange thing is happening. In poetry, it is the moderns that are once again being read and celebrated. When Princeton announced that Eliot's letters to Emily Hale, supposedly love letters, under lock and key in the Firestone Library until 2020 could finally be accessed, there was virtually a feeding frenzy on behalf of the media and the professoria. No later poet can match such interest, although Pound is a close second. At this writing, I've been asked by the TLS to write a leader on recent pound studies. And, and I mean, there's still this kind of interest. So what do these studies include? There's a book called Ezra Pound's Japan, a second on Pound and Pasolini. Pasolini, the communist filmmaker, but who admired Pound very much, an odd couple. There's one called The Rapallo Poets about the town of Rapallo and Mussolini and a fourth called The New Ezra Pound Studies. The industry, it seems, is thriving. At the same time, there's much less interest in later 20th century poets like Allen Ginsberg or Adrian Rich, however more acceptable their politics to a larger public. So what then was modernism and why even as unmentionable as our host Amit Chowdhury reminds us, does it refuse to go away? Before I turn to this vexed question, let us look a little more fully at how the post-World War II generation turned away from modernism that it rejected to create a postmodernism that would be more satisfactory. Now, throughout the 1960s and 70s, I'm taking a well-known example here from Ihab Hassan. I don't know how many of you still know that name. Ihab Hassan was very well known, gave lectures everywhere, conferences everywhere on postmodernism and the differences between modernism and postmodernism. And he would change the chart just slightly. <laughs> In different books, the chart varies a little bit. In 1982, in the dismemberment of Orpheus, one of his later books, the chart looks like this. So, and of course it's simplified, but let's just run through it. So modernism stands for romanticism, symbolism, postmodernism, pataphysics, Dada. Modernism form, and the form is conjunctive or closed form. Postmodernism, the form is anti-form, disjunctive, open. Modernism purpose versus postmodernist play design versus postmodernist chance, distance versus participation, presence versus absence, centering versus decentering or dispersal, metaphor versus metonymy. It's odd to have that on the chart a little bit. The role on Bart term, lisible, readily, rather than scriptible, writerly, origin cause rather than difference, the Derridian difference, trace, determinacy rather than indeterminacy and transcendence versus imminence. Well, convenient chart. And then there were various, you know, sidelines of this. Another popular one in other charts was urbanism versus the global village, urbanism versus the global village. The problem with this and related charts, comparing and contrasting modernism and POMO, is that despite its relentless progressive narrative, just about every attribute attached to postmodernism was already present in the modernism it hoped to correct and surpass. Pataphysics and Dada were historically speaking contemporary with the wasteland, which incidentally is often linked to Dada. Open form has always been used to characterize Pound's cantos. And who was more committed to chance and play than Marcel Duchamp, perhaps the greatest avant-gardist of them all. For me, you know, the really major figure 
of the 20th century. Not quite ready for this yet, but anyway. Or again, what novel was more scriptible than Joyce's Ulysses? What philosopher more on the side of imminence versus transcendence than Heidegger? whose whole fight was for imminence, very much against transcendence. So what we might call the utopian phase of postmodernism, the cult of the new in the 1960s after the war, was in any case short-lived. Absence, dispersal, decentering, disjunction, these terms regularly associated with postmodernism soon acquired a negative valence. Now consider Frederick Jameson's famous essay, the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, first published in 1984 in the New Left Review. I'm not, I'm not quite ready for this slide. You can leave the other on, thank you. Um, now, Jameson is like the famous person and remains, really, this essay has remained so famous and I'm sure most of you know it. It first appeared in the New Left Review in 1984 and then as the first chapter of his book by that same title, um, Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. One fundamental feature of all the postmodernisms, Jameson begins, is the effacement in them of the older, essentially high modernist frontier between high culture and so-called mass or commercial culture. The postmodernisms have in fact been fascinated precisely by this whole degraded landscape of schlock and kitsch, of TV series and Reader's Digest culture, of advertising in motels, of the late show and the great B Hollywood film. And since postmodern culture, also known as media culture, consumer culture, or information society is thus degraded by its capitalist economic base, its products no longer shock or offend as did the oppositional art of the modernist avant-garde. Now, it's incredible how popular this diagnosis was. You have an Andreas Huysens after the Great Divide. I can't tell you how many books. I have a shelf full of books on postmodernism that all make that same point. And the most important one is the breakdown of the divide between high and low, which is considered one of the key features of the period. That the modernists had been elitist, and snobbish, and 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 believed in art separate from life. And after World War II, beginning in the 50s, um, um, that all ended and popular culture became very popular and entered the field and so on. So most people kind of agree with that definition. Jameson now goes on to define the constitutive features of postmodernism as follows. A new depthlessness, well, we already have that here, which finds its prolongation both in contemporary theory and in a whole new culture of the image or the simulacrum, as I was typing that, I thought, I haven't seen that word in a while. The simulacrum, everything used to be, remember about the, the, many of you won't remember, but the older people here will remember Baudrillard and the simulacrum, and that was the key word. A, the simulacrum, a consequent weakening of historicity, both in our relationship to public history and in the new forms of our private temporality, temporality whose schizophrenic structure following Lacan will determine new types of syntax or syntagmatic relationships in the more temporal art, a whole new type of emotional ground tone. And the deep constitutive relationships to a whole new technology, which is itself a figure for a whole new economic world system. Now, the new type of economic emotional ground tone, also called the waning of affect, in postmodern culture, the waning of affect, refers of course to the dissolution of the subject with the consequent dissolution of unique style and the replacement of parody by pastiche, blank parody. And everybody used to write articles about that, pastiche and so-and-so, blank parody and so-and-so. In other words, no meaning, no truths, everything is open for grabs in a way we don't really know what it means. It's play, just play, simulacrum, pastiche, blank parody. I cannot begin to note how influential Jameson's version of postmodernism proved to be, beginning with his an analysis of Andy Warhol, pastiche, and the decenteredness of Los Angeles Bonaventure Hotel. That is very funny. One of the first things he wrote about was, and I live in Los Angeles, was the, it's still there, the Bonaventure Hotel downtown, because he said it had no lobby, no central lobby, therefore no central axis. There aren't rooms around a central axis. You don't know quite where you are. And it is true that I was once in the bar. There's a bar upstairs that goes round and round. And I put a sweater down 
on the side on the ledge and then I had to wait till it came all the way around again. I thought I'd lost it because things are going around, but it isn't really all that remarkable, but he has pages and pages on the Bona Venture Hotel um, where there's no more a central axis that controls the layout of given spaces. But, and this is the big question, if Jameson's analysis is correct, if there's no longer a distinction between say, John Cage's imaginary landscape number four and the late show, well, what is there left for art and literature to do? What path for the novelist or poet and why bother? And I hope we will discuss this in the in when we have the question period. Why, why do we need art at all? If it's just, you know, if there's really no difference between high and low and we just have all this stuff around and anything can be written about, shopping centers, malls, whatever. Well, why do we bother with art? Why, why have it at all? Why, why do we need it? The 21st century has responded to this question in one or two ways, one of two ways. Literature may be treated as primarily instrumental, in which case identity politics becomes central. Our literature in the US foregrounding the sufferings, difficulties and conflicts of various underrepresented groups in society, especially in the US, the descendants of African slaves. On the other hand, though less frequently, emphasis may be on the artwork itself, in which case the inheritance of modernism whether conscious or unconscious comes into play. And here, my epigraph from David Anton, I think is a posit. From the modernism you want, you get the postmodernism you deserve. Even as Andy Warhol was making his screen print of diamond dust shoes, which Jameson talks about at great length, John Cage and his circle, Merce Cunningham, David Tudor, Jasper Johns, Morton Feldman, John Ashbery, were producing complex works that were by no means primarily pastiche and that certainly didn't renounce individual style or the human subject. Jasper Johns just celebrated this past year by two major retrospectives. I wish I could have been there. One of my favorite artists, Jasper Johns, I think great, really great artist. There was the show at the Whitney Museum and another one in Philadelphia just recently, both just closed. And, and I think everybody from all camps agreed that whatever else you say, Jasper Johns is an amazing and great artist and created some of the key forms of, of our time. Unique, and he certainly has a unique and inimitable style. You would never mistake a Jasper Johns for anybody else. Same thing is true of John Cage. And John Cage, for instance, had very little taste for pop culture. And despite his rejection of harmony, as well as melody, regarded a musical composition as a construct that had to be performed with precision and fidelity to the composer's wishes. Now, so if I had to classify Johns or Cage, it would be as a late modernist or belated modernist. Now, let me try to explain why and what I take modernism to be. So this next section is called Modernism Reinvented. For us. The beginning of modernism, writes Peter Nichols, in the introduction, his excellent survey, Modernism as a Literary Guide, like its endings are largely indeterminate, a matter of traces rather than of clearly defined historical moments. Indeed, Nichols, and I would concur, begins with the 1840s in Paris, specifically with the Baudelaire of Fleur de Mal as exhibiting those qualities we have come to think of as modernists. Although the poems in this watershed volume were still written predominantly in fixed verse forms and the controlled metrics of the Alexandrian, the 12 syllable line, their distinct urbanism and concrete detail, their deep irony, the double vision of author and character in a given poem, or of observer and observed, their verbal complexity, studied artifice and linguistic difficulty mark these lyrics as something quite new in literary history. Baudelaire's Paris, which Walter Benjamin wrote about so movingly, a city of autumn mist and puddles, of flaneurs and beggars, peddlers, of window glass and mysterious unknown women, is by anyone's account already a modern city, Fourmillon Cité. It becomes Eliot's model in the wasteland, its urbanism going hand in hand with alienation, the loss of one's identity in what was later to be called the lonely crowd. From Apollinaire's walking poem, Zone, to Picasso's invention of collage, using actual pieces of oilcloth or paper on the surface of the painted canvas, from Marinetti's onomatopoeic sound poem, Zang Tum Tum, 
to Stravinsky's Rite of Spring and Kandinsky's painterly abstractions, modernism broke the mimetic contract that had characterized art for centuries, creating works now characterized by their insistent textuality. And what I mean is it really of all kinds, whether you have Picasso or Duchamp, all kinds of different artists, it broke the mimetic contract where art was supposed to represent what really is a window on reality and, and be realistic. And that was criticized from various points of view. Now, may I have the next slide? Next slide. Yeah, thanks. The Russian avant-garde of the 1910s, which was to my mind the greatest of the avant-garde movements, created verbi vocal visual fields of force, bringing together the poetry of Mayakovsky and Klebnikov with the visual Im images of Mihail Larionov and Natalia Goncharova in startly new ju uh, juxtapositions. What you have on the screen here is Malievich's the Zero, famous Zero Ten exhibition, 1915, right before the war in Petersburg. Those are all Malievich's. They were quite revolutionary, all abstract paintings um, that you really have to see when you see them in, in reproductions like this. They don't look like anything, but the texture is what is absolutely amazing. Anyway, Malievich also was quite a writer. I think a wonderful writer and wrote manifestos. And I'll just read you one, which goes from cubism and futurism to suprematism. He called this art suprematism. May I have the next slide? I have transformed myself in, in the zero into the zero of form and dragged myself out of the rubbish filled pool of academic art. I have destroyed the ring of the horizon and escaped from the circle of things, from the horizon ring, which confines the artist and the forms of nature. To reproduce beloved objects and little corners of nature is just like a thief being enraptured by his leg in irons. The new life of iron and the machine, the roar of automobiles, the glitter of electric lights, the whirring of propellers, have awoken the soul which was stifling in the catacombs, catacombs of ancient reason and has emerged on the roads woven between earth and sky. If all artists could see the crossroads of these celestial paths, if they could comprehend these monstrous runways and the weaving of our bodies with the clouds in the air, then they would not paint chrysanthemums. Then they would not pay chrysanthemums. The next one, please, is just one more of Malievich's. And I hope you get to see these sometime. Yeah, I'm sure you have. Many of you have seen them in various museums. The Museum of Modern Art in New York now has a whole room and they're very and always, and they always the figures look as if the squares look as if they're flying, as if they're alive, really, when you see the real ones. But the idea of not painting that the airplanes being up in the air, seeing the world from the ground, that all the new technologies, which was the amazing thing in modernism, if you had that, then you wouldn't have people painting chrysanthemums, that that was old hat. That's what Malievich said. The result from Malievich was the black square at the 010 exhibition. Such geometric abstraction, which Malievich called suprematism, marks a decisive break with the impressionist painting of the 19th century from Manet to Cezanne. And it doesn't only, make a break from Manet to Cezanne, but earlier, if you go back to the 16th century, even in fact, painting was already representational from the late medieval period on down. So modernism was a major break. It really was a rupture. And whatever people think of it, things really, the, the work really changed. Not what is painted, but the painting itself. That was the central watchword of modernism. A second way of approaching the same structure, indeed a similar rejection of impressionism with its emphasis on the retina, next slide please, uh, was Duchamp's invention of the ready-made. I'll just show you a few. This is the famous bottle rack. This is just was an, in, in, an, an ordinary bottle rack that he found in a store and he called it to take the taste out. There are so many ways you can play with the whole notion of taste and the sexual element. If you look at all the, the empty spokes for the bottles, that there's nothing there. An ordinary industrial object, but it isn't so ordinary because all of Duchamp's pieces have the same basic family resemblances to quote Wittgenstein. They're all industrial objects. They all have an erotic component. I'll show you a few more. Next one, please, the bottle dryer. That's the famous bicycle wheel. I have one right on my desk. Somebody gave me a copy of it. <laughs> Don't talk about it here anymore. 
Here's my bicycle, the bicycle wheel. Anyway, the bicycle wheel has become like a logo at the Museum of Modern Art because it's such an amazing piece if you really look at it. It seems very simple. But instead of having a bike that works that you can ride, you have a the, the, the wheel is in the table with the rod pointing down into the hole. You can think of all the sexual thing there, but it's really just a little stool and you can't really spin it. You can't move it. And don't forget at the turn of the 20th century, there were all the endless images of girls on bikes that Toulouse Lautrec painted and, and meeting somebody on a bike in the park was considered a kind of important sort of assignation. And the bicycle played a great part. Duchamp in one fell swoop just took it and put it inside the stool. The next one. Next one, please. And the famous fountain, probably Duchamp's most famous thing, photographed here by Stieglitz so that it has a beautiful background. And you know, I don't know if you know the famous history of this, but if you don't, this was when there was the famous salon um, at the, the, the Salon uh, of the Independence in 1917 in New York, and Duchamp was on the committee. And the rule was everybody could send in two things, and all they had to do was pay a dollar per item and it would be shown no matter who you were. In other words, anybody could show. Not just artists, you had all kinds of art. I have a whole catalog of what the show looked like. But when this came in, and this was just an ordinary urinal that Duchamp turned upside down and sent in under the name R. Mutt there on the left, R. Mutt in 1917, which plays on Armut, poverty in German, or the cartoon Mutt and Jeff, R. Mutt, um, they wouldn't accept it. They turned it down. The committee turned it down. So Duchamp quit and he wrote a big article where he said, and this has become famous, um, yes, it's quite true. Our Mutt didn't, in, didn't paint anything and he didn't invent the fountain, the so-called fountain. He found it, but the fact is that he chose it. And that was a new definition of art, that it wasn't so much what one painted or represented, but the fact that he chose it. He's the one who chose it. It's the context and nobody else had done that or whatever really, it still hasn't been matched by later art that tries to do the same kind of thing. And um, he called it fountain because of the shape, uh, it, the woman's around, but he combines male and female and he combines the whole idea of fountains which as you know, was a huge symbol, always in art, the gushing fountain, the romantic fountain, inspiration, imagination, and so on. Okay, next one, I'll just show you one more. This is the famous snow shovel that's hung from the ceiling and that's called In Advance of the Broken Arm. And again, Duchamp just went in to a hardware store and bought this and everybody said, well, that's not art, what is that? But it has all kinds of allusions, first of all, to the fact that this was the beginning where people could actually have snow shovels and do it themselves and do actual work. But also, if you know American painting, the endless paintings of oh, um, workers with shovels, workers doing something new and having shovels. So Duchamp just again took it separately and just hung it up with the joke in advance of the broken arm that you would break your arm if you shovel. Okay. So, so much for that. Now, these are the clearest examples I can think of very quickly of an art revolutionary in its time. The ready-mades like Duchamp's large glass have never been surpassed. Indeed, the continental avant-garde had no real counterpart in England, where the leading modernists of the period were two Americans, Elliot and Pound, and an Irishman, James Joyce, and another Irishman, Yeats, if you will, and a Pole, Joseph Conrad. Indeed, unless we merely equate modernism with the global early 20th century, the revolution associated as it was with the technological revolution, specifically the new modes of transportation and communication, and with the wonders of electricity, were very much a European, specifically, I would say, a continental affair. Um, French cubism and collage art, Swiss data, German film, Italian typography, Austrian fiction, especially that of Kafka and Musil, and Russian art and architecture. These are the high points of modernism we can trace back to Baudelaire. England never really had its own avant-garde. The vorticism of Blast and Wyndham Lewis was, after all, essentially a version of the Italian futurism that began with Marinetti's 1909 manifesto. As for the modernism of the Bloomsbury's, and I people get angry at me for saying this and we can argue it, 
I don't think, I don't consider that really quite modernism yet. I think that's a late Victorianism. The class concerns of Forrester and Virginia Woolf look back to Victorianism as readily as they look forward to new forms of narrative. And despite all the talk of American modernism in the US, the making of the new has always been slightly suspect, romantic, realist, didactic paradigms persisting even in the age of Faulkner and Hemingway. Faulkner is probably as close in fiction as we have of a true modernist, but realism always continued. Sinclair Lewis, John Dos Passos, Richard Wright, Zora Neale Hurston, Eugene O'Neill, probably the most famous Playwright is very much a realist playwright, and you know that isn't really a full blown modernism. Okay, now I'm going to turn, and of course I'm talking through my hat because I know very little about it, but I want to relate it if I can to what I've been reading and the situation in India. If, as I've been arguing, modernism is essentially a European phenomenon, what then of modernism on other continents, specifically in colonial and post colonial India? In a very interesting book called Bombay Modern. Arun Kalatkar, a bilingual literary culture, uh, published in 1916, Anjali Nelekar raised precisely this question. Indian modernism, she argues, have far too often been parsed in only one language. This is a big thing. After all, in India, you have more than one language, which creates a very different situation. The Satotari period, 1955-1980, she says, has been traditionally framed as a transnational whirlwind of influences and borrowings, with English, American, European, and Latin American movements taking center stage, and where these transnational influences are framed as the muses for Indian regional and English writing. This indeed was a global moment in many ways. The influences of the Vietnam War, the aggressive presence of the United States through academic institutions in India, the opening up of book markets to international journals and literary texts, the easy availability of journals like the Evergreen Review and books published by Grove Press, the beat writer's visit to India in 1962, alongside the Penguin anthologies of modern poetry that became available in Bombay and the attempts by the United States to recruit um, Indian writers for the ideological, for its ideological battles and propaganda wars, all contributed toward an extension of the cosmopolitanism of Bombay, evident since the 19th century. But the interconnection between the literatures of different languages is never studied fully when reading modern Indian poetry. So, the first thing clearly that must, I, I guess, be said about about Indian poetry is that. Although my, uh, there's a lot in, in English, the early version was in English. After all, they're the other languages. So it's already going to be different from something like French poetry, which even if they're dialects or American, you know, is basically French, makes a big difference. Uh, Kolatka wrote in both English and Marathi. Uh, uh, and although the Kolatka circle claimed to be influenced by Allen Ginsberg, this is something interesting to watch for. Here, I really agree with Harold Bloom as far as the anxiety of influence goes. Just because somebody says they were influenced by somebody doesn't mean they really were. It's very hard to know one's own influences. So because Allen Ginsberg with Peter Orlovsky spent so much time in India, it's often thought he was an influence. But I haven't, looking at the poetry, I don't see any real Ginsberg. Ginsburg. And I like Alan Ginsberg. I like how I don't I don't really see that influence. More important in looking at the work in the little magazines, which I've been doing, were the concrete poets of the 1950s and 60s, especially the De Campos brothers in Brazil, who were themselves, by their own account, belated modernist, delayed by World War II, when very little information about the arts was coming through from Europe to a country as far away as Brazil. And Augusto de Campos has explained that to me. I never realized that, that, all right, after World War I, in the 1920s, they did, it all trickled in. They got a lot of, some information about the modernism going on in Europe. But then when the war came, and even after the war, it wasn't really till the 1950s that it, it, the arts became global, much more global, and that there was much more communication. So soon after 1945, Augusto and Haroldo de Campos were sued in Brazil, were disseminating the work of Pound and Joyce, and together with Decio Pignatari, they founded a group called Noigandra. Noigandra is a word that comes straight from the cantos. Uh, and it's a pun, I won't go into it now, which made the case for a concrete poetry, one where form equals content, in that the very spatial disposition of words and letters 
on a given page create semantic clusters. The concretists looked especially to Mallarmé's and Coup de Day, Pound's Cantos, and especially Joyce's Finnegan's Wake for their inspiration. Poetry, they declared, could never constitute a mere window onto a pre-existing reality. It was always the reality itself. Now, from what I can surmise, Indian concrete poetry had its origins, if I can have the next slide, please, um, in the seemingly simple down-to-earth poetry of William Carlos Williams and E.E. E. Cummings, Anjari Nelekar began, begins her study by citing the following little poem by Kolatkar. My name is Arun Kolatkar. I had a little matchbox. I lost it. Then I found it. I kept it in my right-hand pocket. It is still here, there, sorry. And she has a long analysis of it. So I won't go into that now, but she points out how the emphasis is on the everyday, the random, a free verse that seems casual, but is actually carefully wrought via anaphora, beginning at line ends and the T endings, lost it, found it, kept it, pocket, all those T's that you have throughout. And it's certainly, if you know Williams, it reminds you of the red paper box, which is in Williams collection, spring and all. So Williams is certainly an influence. Spring and all takes us back to modernism, 1923, the dates of spring and all. An interesting, another interesting example is Arvind Krishna Merotra's Culture and Society. Next slide, whose words? Okay, that's the cover. Yeah, yeah. can we, yeah, have a cover this name. That was the cover and, um, and the poem itself, yeah. Then there's some artwork. And here, here, this is it, culture and society. A little, can you get it all on? Yeah, to the yeah. bottom. I, I can't, I can't see it. Yeah, there it yeah. is. There it is. Perfect. Now, in a way, this is more like the calligram of Apollinaire. It's certainly a modernist poem. I mean, Apollinaire is the one who invented the so-called calligram picture poems. The concrete poets actually thought picture poems were a little too easy, you know, to make a poem that actually looks like what it is. It's again, then mimetic. But this one is very good in its own way. Um, is it a rocket? Is it a tower? It, it's tightly structured, but it has minimalist content of a single consonant in languages like French, H isn't even sounded. So you really only have three vowels. And the poem is designed to mock, I think, the monumentality of towers by trivializing their solidity and presence. Ha ha and oh oh for towers. And the shape of the picture poem recalls not only concrete poetry, but as I say, the work of Apollinaire written during the First World War at the height of bombing on the Western Front. Kind of faux monumentality is an offspring of modernic text. Or again, okay, that's the only one of that one I wanted to see. So again, if we can go back to the, you can just turn that off and we'll go back to the slides. Yeah. Um, in 1968, R.K. Joshi produced a poem called, um, yeah, let's just go on. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, produced um, a poem called Ratrika, I'm probably mispronouncing, a, a poem that appears in handwritten form in the little magazine Vaca, a poem that as it travels down the page descends into illegible, um, illegible scribbling so as to represent the sleep deprived traveler on the railway platform who can't help but fall asleep. And as Nariakar notes, there's no complete poem. They're just missing whole having to be imagined from a set of fragments. The next one, or is it? The, yeah, and they're just a couple of fragments and here's a fragment. Let me lie beside you, thighs, the sleepy footfall, a mirage, such bitter traps lovely rest. And here the imagery is not especially distinctive, but it is played off against the poet's Indian calligraphy and the one we just saw, a writing that sometimes seems to form words, but is designed as largely as a curvy linear scribble that becomes increasingly illegible as it moves from center to periphery. A major design specialist, Yoshi produced innovative computer graphics, including Indian letter forms, dot matrix fonts, and PLS fonts as a step toward multilingual text processors. The creation of fonts is clearly central for the Indian designer who cannot, like our own, rely on English alone. And here, post-colonialism and a delayed modernism come together. 
In his mission statement for this conference, Amit Chaudhuri asked why the modern has slipped out of language and explains, partly it has to do with the view that modernity is foreign or even an offshoot of colonialism. We were on our way to creating an indigenous modernity. This argument goes, then colonialism forever interrupted that process. Colonial modernity is a definition of a pervasive reality that established itself in India from the mid 19th century onwards, but it's also an implicit reminder of what never happened, a homegrown authentic modernity. So if colonialism interrupted the process of modernization as it was known early in the 20th century, so, and this has been my argument, have been the world wars and revolutions in the West that have left us today with a body of work that is carrying out the unfinished mandate, I think, of early modernism. So let me conclude with a recent example of what I'm calling here delayed modernism, and that's Shumana Roy's How I Became a Tree. I, he, I just giving you the cover of it. Here it is, How I Became a Tree, which in its Yale University Press edition, 2017, has been a bestseller in the United States, which is amazing, really, you know, amazing for poetry. I was originally wary of this book, I'll be frank, thinking it might be for children, or it might be cute, or a little escapist, and much to my surprise, it's an absolute delight, if you haven't read it, playful, ironic, and an often sardonic meditation, less on nature so much as what is wrong with contemporary human life. Roy's very opening paragraph sets the scene, and she writes, at first it was underwear. I wanted to become a tree because trees do not wear bras. I love that idea. Then it had to do with the specter of violence. I love the way in which trees cope with dark and lonely places while sunlessness decided curfew hours for me. Now these observations set the stage for the narrator's obsession with tree time, tree time and tree sound. And it's so interesting to think, what is tree time? I live surrounded by trees. And during the pandemic, I wrote about my own trees here, a beautiful palm tree outside. Trees, she points out, can't be hurried. They grow in there at their own natural pace. And trees are not, as it's often thought, silent. They make sounds of resistance as they fight wind, water, cutting, and breaking. How does their resistance compared to our own, there's a good question. Now, Roy's complex structure branches like the dendrological root system it models. She relates it to the rhizome, Deleuze's rhizome, um, in a way, in countless directions. The book is at once, and there's the interesting thing, what is the genre? It's at once an essay. It could be called lyric poetry and narrative. It's tone alternately playful, angry, reflective, rebellious, its units, its individual units are either aphorisms, anecdotes, citations, metaphors, memories, folk tales, myths. The very thought of genre, writes Roy, citing Andre Tarkov Tarkovsky, is as cold as a tomb. The Rishi insists no natural division of genres, perhaps only a recourse to the sensibility that can hold conflicting genres together. Now, what does this have to do with modernism? How I Became a Tree does feature the indeterminacy and difference we think of perhaps as postmodern, but on the whole, it has very little to do with Jameson's paradigm, blank parody or pastiche, depthlessness, no, a nagging emptiness, and above all, the erasure of the human subject. Certainly, we have here a human subject. So that whole notion of the erasure of the human subject now seems old hat. But on the contrary, it's exuberant experimentation with genre, form, point of view, and diction carries on the tradition of such modernists as Mina Loy or Blaise Sandra. In fact, Blaise Sandra has on his so-called postcards, uh, just a set, that's what they were called, postcards. They remind me in some ways of this, and, and Shumana may not even know his work, but they do. Poetry is, as the early avant-garde understood, the language art, and as such, modernism is still the most important game in town. Thank you. That's all. Uh, thank you, Marjorie. Uh, I want to say it was brilliant and beautiful, but it was also so much uh, more uh, slightly. I'm grateful and I'm, I don't know, <laughs> slightly embarrassed by the kind of attention you paid to my you. book. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, the, uh, this is open for question. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, something uh, that I know you've spoken about in your memoir, uh, but 
you know, um, this is a question that is often asked to quote unquote creative writers, but one I think uh, many of us who've not read or those of us who've not read um, your memoir might want to know. I'm curious to know about the things that led the little girl Marjorie towards a life in modernist poetics. Uh, what did you read as a child and how did you come to well, yes? That, because that's very yeah. interesting. That's a great question. Yeah. Well, I was brought up much more in the classics, you know. Um, I was brought up on Goethe and Schiller in German. I, I come from Vienna, I was six years old, but we were read to. And so I still know, I still love those for lyric poetry. I still think Goethe is the great, you know, lyric poetry more than the English and American writers. But then, then there was a period where I was in high school and got the stupid name Marjorie, changed my name from Gabrielle, which is my real name, Gabriela. And, and I chose Marjorie simply because there was a very popular girl in my class whose name was Margie, and I wanted to be so American. I wanted to be like most teenagers, just like everybody else. You know, I didn't want to be German, and I didn't want to be seen with my grandmother or something in the subway speaking German, especially not during the war. And so, and I studied American literature, and I didn't want to study um, I always was interested in French, but I didn't want to study. I never had a course in German literature. I never formally studied any of that work. But then, um, in fact, I think I already liked modernist works even then, because Austrian was a very modern. Yes, somebody, uh, one of the speakers yesterday who spoke about the Bauhaus. Um, Austria was a very modernist country, the clean lines of architecture. You know, Klimt is so popular now as an Austrian artist, but he wasn't really so popular. I mean, everything was very modern. We always had very modern furniture and um, Bauhaus kind of furniture. And that was the interest, no ornament. That was the whole idea in terms of architecture. And um, when I went to graduate school, when I went to college and graduate school, I actually wrote my, my um, Master's thesis on Proust and Virginia Woolf. Well, I still love Proust, but I don't really love Virginia Woolf so much anymore. We talk about that. But, um, and, but why did I switch to poetry? These things happen partly coincidentally. I happened to have a wonderful professor who taught Byron. We were doing Byron and the Romantics. It was great. And then Pound and, and Elliot and so forth. And I just got really interested in poetry. I'm still very interested, though, in fiction, although I don't always read so much current fiction, but I'm especially interested, and that was true of modernism, of mixed forms, genres that weren't one clear genre, so that you had in Marinetti, you know, in my book on futurism, I have a whole chapter on manifestos as an art form. And that was an amazing form, really, the manifesto, and the performance poem, and the and I love typography. So I always was kind of interested in modernism, and um, I guess following, following Duchamp, who says, Art has become much too retinal. What he meant by that is that the Impressionists, and of course I love the French Impressionists, but he meant the art was all the same. It was always just the eye. There was no mind involved. There seemed to be no mind involved. And there was the French, there's the French famous, you know, after some bad comment pet as stupid as a painter. That, that's what people said. Oh, so-and-so, he's as stupid as a painter. Painting was considered a lesser art because all it did was reproduce what's there. And so when Duchamp said, when Maillet said, I don't want to paint chrysanthemums, and Duchamp said, we've had enough retinal art. And he said the retinal a kind of trauma Art used to be able to have a mind and we can kind of come back to the idea of mind. And in fact, he went to Munich and studied the Kanachs, the paintings by Kanach in the, in the museum in Munich. So influences are always very strange. But to come back to the original topic for the conference, modernism got this bad reputation already early on, as I say, even from Frank Kermode, who was in fact a very, not a very radical critic in a way, mild-mannered in a way, mainly a scholar, um, because of the, the bad politics. And there's no doubt the politics was very bad. But um, the argument would be, and I, I go by this argument, that art has to be representative of its own time, whatever you know the time is. And Jer Jerome McGann once wrote a very interesting essay on the cantos where he pointed out that of course Pound was a terrible person. And that shows you what that period was like that you had terrible people like Ezra Pound and those were the views. And it's important to know that and to see what a period is like. So I guess my bad noir, my enemy 
today is the art that's the poetry that is all didactic. It really has nothing to it. And it just, you know, anything, as long as it's an angry poem about politics or about race or about gender, and there's nothing, to, I, I don't think it's poetry at all. I don't understand what makes it poetic. Maybe somebody can explain that to me. So I was very happy looking at these little magazines from India from the 60s to see that actually what seemed to come in were short little poems like William Carlos Williams, Concrete poetry, not Allen Ginsberg. Nobody seemed to be writing like Howell. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there are a lot of people that do, but that those weren't the big influences so much. So now I don't know how all this applies to fiction. And after all, this conference is mostly about fiction. Uh, I mean, being a, 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 the novel and so on. I think from the early 20th century on, we learned from the early 20th century that a novel doesn't need to have a straightforward narrative even though I love my favorite novel in the world is Anna Karenina, you know, by Tolstoy. And my other favorite is Proust. I think Proust to me would be the great modernist. Uh, during the pandemic, I've been rereading him all the time. You know, you never can get enough of Proust. He's certainly a modernist, but that you can, that you can do things in different ways. You can lay out a novel in a different way, as say Proust does. And, um, and that was the great lesson of modernism. And then it was interrupted. And then there was the feeling, oh, we don't want any of that. The politics is so bad. But in fact, I don't think it ever went away. So as I say, I think what we now have in the 21st century is a kind of, I would like to call it a delayed modernism, if you will. I don't know how, how the people feel about that. Uh, thank you. There's a question from Ranjan, uh, Ranjan Ghosh, whom you know, and Biswamit Devedi. I'll read both the questions. And the last question will be by Amit Chaudhary, who will ask it himself. So let me read their questions. Ranjan's question is, um, as always, it's been a navigation and journey with profit and delight. I'm finishing a book on 1922. Is it chronologically modern or has always been modern? because it exceeded the protocols and prescriptions of modernism? How about thinking the modern as always as something that keeps self exceeding itself? It leaves me to roll out a discussion on what we mean or configure to mean by tradition. Just a second, uh, I'll just scroll down. And canon, I guess reading the expressionist poets now with Kenneth Goldsmith and others is about continually revising any settlement on canon. Uh, modernism for me changed our habit and habitus. It continues yes. to do so. It sources yes. out our transplants plasticity of understanding. And Biswamit's question is, uh, he's a poet, um, Biswamit. I'm wondering there's so much in ancient Indian and regional poetry in Hindi uh, sorry, in Hindu and Islamic traditions that are so akin to experimental and modernist experiments. I just discovered the equivalent of calligrams in Vedic poetry. I'm wondering how we place those traditional roots in sound, typography, etc., in relation to modernist experiments for their work. Uh, would well, you like to respond to this before we come uh, come to Amit Chaudhary? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a wonderful comment, and I agree with every word, kind of in a way. Now, by the way, Guy Davenport talks about in the geography of imagination, he calls it the primitive, which has negative connotations, but how early work, how the classics or like reading things are brought back, that one of the things modernism is, was a return to Greek and Roman literature, Indian literature, of course, we'll look at what T.S. Eliot did for that matter with, with um, Sanskrit and, and the feeling of a larger world. And I think that's a main characteristic of modernism. Now notice you could only have that once you had a kind of communication that was broader. In other words, I always think of the Victorian novels and it's not that I don't like them, but think for a minute about Dickens or George Eliot. They all had English names. They were English, uh, Thackeray, Charles Dickens, Sir Walter Scott, et cetera, et cetera. There was no question about exile or border crossings or anything because they were English. And the big subject was class. You know, Lionel Trilling has written a lot about that. The big subject of 19th century novels and I love them. I mean, I'm not saying they're not great novels, was class, class relationships, which were very big. I think what replaced it, and I like uh, the comment very much, the exceeding the protocols and prescriptions of modernism was that it on the one hand took you back to the ancient world 
and you could bring that back in in modernist form and have a broader view in that way. And that's why modernism changed our habit and habit is so much. But one thing that I can't quite figure out is why did it never really happen in say England? I mean, England never really had an avant-garde, not in music, not in the visual arts, you know, which is sort of the main thing. And in literature, you know, D.H. Lawrence, if you want to say, who's one of my favorite writers. Yes, working class writer. But look how far, and I mean, Ford Maddox Ford was from Germany, Conrad, the writers of modernism were all from someplace else. And you had the Irish writers and so on. And it's just some, I think, because the English tradition was so strong. And I think that's the other thing. If a tradition is too strong, that strong, then it's hard to get beyond it. And so in England, the great thing are the romantic poets for poetry. You never can seem to get beyond on Keats, I, you know, I love them, Wordsworth, so forth. Those are great poets. And so um, there is no quite getting beyond that. And, and somewhere or other, also in England, there's a great sense of mistrust of mixed genres and all kinds of things. I used to have great arguments with my English friends about these things, and it never really quite caught on, nor did it catch on after a while. But when you get the novel, let, let's take something like Kingsley Amos, or we take Iris Murdoch, writers like that. And the, I mean, I just never think of them doing anything, you know, I, I can't think that one can take somebody like Kingsley Amos that seriously, but I have many English friends who do, who think that's an important writer. I think Kingsley Amos, I don't know, you know, not to me, but that may just be me. And as I say, it's at heart that I'm continental. And I wanna say some, just a word about my book, Edge of Irony, because that's about Austrian modernism. Now the Austrians did not have the typical modernist features, collage, fragmentation, all that. It's different again. And there it is in fiction. And that's a fiction that is so deeply ironic, as in Musil, that um, that there is really no, um, you know, there really are no answers. You always have questions and no answers. And it's endlessly fascinating that way. And I do think you have great fiction writers there. Some of the best fiction writers were the Austrians between the wars those writers yeah thank you and now i'm at your question let this be the last one for this session yeah yes. sorry yeah we are we are sort of uh we've, we've overshot a little bit but um it it, it was wonderful listening to you marjorie I, ju I just um yeah it said got me thinking and um i i uh I, I have one question but i i have a comment and a clarification can i can i sort of add those as well um, so, the, so the, the 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 clarification had to do with uh, the the mission statement. So when I talk about the fact that uh, colonialism stopped the possibility of a homegrown modernity, I'm I'm quoting a position that others have. It's not my. Oh, position. I know. Oh, I know that. I know that. No. Yeah. No, I knew uh, that. I said that. Did you yeah. take that and and you agree with me, Bay? I mean, you believe in modernism, certainly. And but that is the view that colonialism, that modernism, is really, you know, the wrong thing and all right. that. Uh, I I I I think there was a um, um, modernism came very early to India in the 19th century, and maybe I'll talk about it in my. Uh, oh, good. Oh, talk. see, I don't know but, that. Um, but. Um, uh, also, just just to add a, uh, something about Ginsburg, a couple of things. Uh, so he he comes to India with Olofsky in the early sixties. Um, so much is being made about, and and rightly so maybe about him meeting up with the Bombay poets. But you know that that he he had a Ginsburg. Um, despite being a magnificently interesting person and intelligent person he was, he, he had ideas to do with authenticity and the mother tongue, which made him prejudiced towards the Bombay poets. So the people he really hung out with were really? Shakti Chattopadhyay and Shunil Gangabadhyay. Oh, and interesting. In, in that's interesting. I didn't know that. Thank and, you. And, and, and it was their Lord. work that he was taken by and even translated, I think. You know, he I think he translated uh, Shakti Chattopadhyay. So, um, as far as Kolatka's uh, connection with Ginsburg is uh, concerned, you're, you're right to point out that you don't see, you see more of uh, Williams in, in, in his English work, in Kolatka's English work. That there, there are the uh, uh, um, Kolatka's versions, to use the word Lowell used of translation, uh, of, of uh, 17th century poets like Tukaram and Nyaneshwari, uh, where he uses the language of the beat poets. But really? he, yeah. But all of these people, 
don't use, they, I say use because it's not influence, it's found material for them. It, oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. So, so I, um, I see, I understand. Well, of uh, course, they also come together through Pound. After all, Ginsburg is the one who thought Pound was the great poet. He said, I don't care what his politics were, he's the great American poet. You know, that's what Ginsburg said. Right. So the question to you, sorry, there was just one question then um, that had to do with um, Andy Warhol, whom you positioned against um, yeah. uh, Merce Cage. Cunningham and, and, and John yeah. Cage. Uh, and uh, all that was wonderful. But I was wondering about and, Andy Warhol, does he not also in a sense come from, uh, emerge from Duchamp, whom you- whom Yes, you of were, course. Yes and no. Yes, he would say yes. And then he emerged from Cage. Cage really didn't like him much. He does, it is, the obvious thing is to say, yes, he does. Of course he does come out of Duchamp. Everybody does in a way. But, I, and again, maybe this is just personal. I I thought he was very, I, I mean, I like Andy Warhol, but I think, he, you know, you couldn't do without him in a way. You have that basic image. But finally, he's not, he's not so interesting to me. I don't think it's that interesting. And maybe it is because of the lack of human, the human subject. You know, in the end, we can't very well do without the human, without the subject. And as I say, if you compare um, Warhol to Jasper Johns, same time, exactly the same period, well, where Jasper Johns did say the number series, just painted the numbers. They're so beautiful. <laughs> Each number is absolutely beautiful, and yet they're just numbers. And and so there's that duality. And you and in Andy Warhol, when I see them, yeah, they're fine, you know. But I feel, yeah, yeah, okay. Here's the Campbell soup can, you know, it's fine. Um, but uh, but that may be just more me because um, um, Ranjan mentions Kenneth Goldsmith, whom I've written about a lot, and he adores Andy Warhol. So on many of these things, we can differ, but I hope. What I wanted to make clear was that this dislike, this feeling that modernism is a bad thing, you know, and 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 that after colonialism you couldn't have it anymore. That's just not. I really think it's not true, and it has come and back. It never really went away. That's really well. You've yeah. you've expressed all of that eloquently and fearlessly. So yeah, that, 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 <laughs> yeah. maybe somebody's yeah. angry. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Uh, there's, may, can we take one last question, you think? Sure, I can, but I mean, I don't know um, the time. Just if you can deal with it in a minute. Sure. So, sure. Sorry, if that sounds okay. quick. So okay. but yeah. This is David <laughs> Liu. Can we, could we say that Euro modernism may have lots its mark, but keeps ghosting its own tomb and embalmers and its temporality is perfusive. Perfusive is in quotes, yeah. Uh, lost its marquee, but keeps ghosting its own tomb. I think that's a very good way of putting it. I think that's true. And actually, when I was thinking about the American, it was funny because, of course, Americans would think, well, of course, we have modernism. There are all kinds of courses on modernism. But it is interesting and odd in a way. And it so much has to do with history. Well, I'll be brief. But, you know, the, and the United States was a Puritan country. Theater was outlawed throughout the 19th century. You had all the poems by Emerson, you know, and Longfellow, tell me not mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, you know, didactic poems. And there's a didactic quality often in America that comes back. I mean, each nation has its own thing, but actually India is a country that I think of all countries was in a way very because of the, the ancient things do fit in and become so much part of it because they were never realistic in that sense, you know or didactic in that obvious sense, right? Okay, I think we should stop there. Uh, yeah. Thank you really, Marjorie. Thank you, when I first, thank you. Uh, when I thank first you. got to know of the title of your talk, which is on, you know, about the modern after the postmodern, I in fact thought of Amit Chaudhary, you know, this modern writer or modernist yes. writer. Uh, yes. So, you know, because you've been I reading his work. Right. And, <laughs> yeah, and many yeah. of the things that you said about representation and he's Would been teaching, of me. course, Yes, he's been teaching a course on modern Indian literature and so many of these things fit in. I'm so glad I could be part of this conversation. Thank you, Marjorie. I know you, you have to sleep now. And no, I'm going to stay. No, no, no. No, 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 I'll stay and listen a little while anyway. Thank sure, you. I will. Thank, Thank you. you to all of you. And then, yeah, bye then. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Thanks so Thank much, you. Marjorie and Shumana. Thank you.